Uh, start the second session of the day. Uh, the first talk is by Roman Scocchimaro, uh, Bias Loops. Thank you. Um, so this is a uh, work in, um, in part in a paper already out with Alex Egemeyer and Rob Smith, and another paper, a second paper, which is what I will mostly be talking about here with additionally Martin Croce and Ariel Sanchez. Um, so the subject is um, nonlinear uh, loops, nonlinear corrections due to galaxy bias. Um, and so, so what we are interested in here is the relationship between tracers such as uh, galaxies uh, and the underlying dark matter density fluctuations. Uh, we are interested at large scale, so we can use perturbation theory. And in this talk, I'm going to go up to fourth order in perturbation theory, so we can discuss the one loop by spectrum. And the motivation is that if you look at the current uh, analysis, say, of the BOSS uh, survey, the analysis of the power spectrum and by spectrum are, done, are not done in a consistent way. You go to one loop in the power spectrum, but people have only used three level. Uh, bias, so there is an inconsistency there that we want to fix. And I'm going to assume that their fluctuations initially are Gaussian, coming from inflation, um, and that there is no velocity bias, although many of such terms are automatic and included in the uh, things I will talk about later. And so basically what we are after is uh, the relationship between dark matter and galaxies is a Galilean invariant because of the lack of velocity bias, a Galilean invariant set of operators, which are local in second derivatives of the nonlinear potential, gravitational potential and velocity potential that relate a galaxy to density fluctuations. Um, so let's start with the simplest uh, model of galaxy bias that goes back to the uh, 80s. Um, and so in the simplest model, you assume that the density fluctuations for any tracer such as galaxies, uh, sorry, there is a delta missing in the first term. Uh, so it's linear in delta, quadratic in delta cubic, and so on, um, where these bias are the Taylor expansion of the density fluctuations of galaxies with respect to matter. And you realize if you write something like this, when you calculate correlation functions such as power spectrum and by spectrum, there are divergences that appear which are proportional to the variance of the density field. So these parameters that you see here are not the observables and a way that you measure. Okay? Um, so another way of writing this expansion, which is in terms of observables, is to trade these Taylor coefficients by their expectation value instead of evaluating a delta equal to zero, and that's known as the renormalized expansion that goes back to so-called renormalized perturbation theory in the case of nonlinear evolution. And that expansion now looks a, a little bit different once you expand it in terms of these objects. And these objects, because they're expectation values, they're actually observables, and these numbers are the numbers that you actually measure in simulations, for example, when you cross-correlate galaxies with matter and divide by matter-matter, or you do the same for the three-point function and so on. So this is a convenient way of recasting this expansion so that no divergences appear when you calculate observables. Now, this was for the case where the, everything is local in density, in density fluctuations, so you only have powers in delta, but in reality the galaxy bias expansion is more complicated because, as I said at the beginning, uh, the operators that are allowed are uh, local in the second derivatives of the potentials. So, if th so you have things that we call local um, operators, which are the ones we had before, but now we have also, in addition, these so-called Galilean objects here, G2, G3, which are the only rotational invariant objects you can write in three dimensions, which are uh, local in second derivatives of the potential phi. Um, and so basically you can write now, augment the local bias expansion by these terms. And then, so this will be the quadratic order, cubic order, and fourth order. 
And if nonlinear evolution uh, from Gaussian initial conditions was local in the initial fluctuations, uh, that's what happens, for example, in the so-called uh, Soldovich approximation, then these are the only operators you will have up to fourth order in perturbation theory. But because evolution, uh, nonlinear evolution, due to um, uh, just uh, gravity is non-local, you have an extra set of operators now, which are the similar Galileans now, but in terms of the nonlinear um, uh, Lagrangian potentials that connect initial particle positions to final particle positions through the displacement field. So the displacement field that describes nonlinear evolution now has a set of uh, potentials. If it was just Soldovich, then it will only be linear term, so it will only find one, but because there is quadratic and cubic corrections, uh, these guys induce non-local evolution and they induce an additional set of operators. Okay, so this is a complete basis now up to fourth order. So as you can see, this is a bit, um, I mean, it's interesting, but it sounds very complicated because the number of parameters uh, increases uh, dramatically as you, as you go to higher order. So we'll see, discuss how to simplify, you know, what kind of analysis can we do that systematically shrinks the parameter space while remaining accurate. Um, so, so this is now the, you know, before you do any renormalization, so the renormalized expansion, now you do the same thing as I did for local bias in the first page. You just trade now these derivatives, which are written now in Fourier space, in terms of expectation values, and this leads to what we call the gamma expansion. Um, uh, but anyway, that's irrelevant, it's just the name. So, so you have, you know, now you have this set of uh, uh, renormalized expansion coefficients. Now these coefficients are not numbers anymore, they depend on the wave numbers and on the geometry of these uh, k vectors, um, just because these operators are you know, they have a lot more structure than just delta to the n. Um, so, diagrammatically, what we are doing, if you are interested in, in diagrams, is constructing these objects, which are these renormalized bias parameters, as just a sum of all the irreducible diagrams with a given uh, number of external lines. So, for gamma 1, which has one external line, for gamma 2, there are two external lines, and you write all the possible irreducible diagrams and you sum them up and that corresponds to these objects. And out of these objects, you construct the power spectrum and the bias spectrum, or three-point function in Fourier space. So what does these guys look like? You can easily write the expressions for them for, from those diagrams and they are relatively simple. Okay, so all the uh, three-level corrections, so for, for for uh, gamma 1, it's just linear bias plus a one-loop term. Gamma 2 is just the two terms at three order, B2 and the tidal uh, tensor bias. And then you have uh, the one-loop corrections. And for gamma 3, we only need three levels, so we don't need to write the one-loop corrections. So from these objects, you just write the power spectrum and the bias spectrum, and it's uh, very easily in the sense that unlike standard perturbation theory, when when you write uh, the one loop and the two loop and so on, the number of diagrams per loop increases, whereas in this expansion, for example, for the power spectrum, there is only one diagram per loop. So it's, uh, everything is much easier in that sense. So how does this work uh, in practice? So for the case of the power spectrum, this has been known for many years, um, including the one loop correction um, uh, gives you a fairly good description. Uh, here I'm using galaxies, which are, uh, and the volume corresponding to the Voss uh, survey, just for an example, and that's all the galaxies I'm gonna show here from uh, these particular simulations. And so, so here is a linear bias, quadratic bias, the tidal tensor bias, a cubic, uh, the only cubic term that appears, and a noise parameter. Um, and you can see, so the dashed line here is the correct answer for V1. You can see as you march, as you go to higher and higher K, then you get the right answer 
for V1, the other parameters are poorly constrained because the power spectrum doesn't do a good job on constraining uh, the other parameters. Um, so the question is what happens uh, when you try to do the same for the, for the bi spectrum? Okay, so here is the expression with all these gamma objects that I described already. In addition, you have some uh, noise contributions. So in total, you have uh, nine free parameters now, seven bias parameters appearing here, and two noise parameters. And I simplify the expressions to actually, because the fourth order parameters um, that appear here, these fourth order parameters are poorly constrained. So what, what I did was to, to reduce the parameter space. I assume that these guys are zero in the very far past and then evolve them by nonlinear evolution, they get generated with an amplitude that depends on the other parameters. So, so these are zero in the initial conditions, but in the final conditions, they depend on the other parameters in a way that can be cal calculated, as I'll show later. So in that sense, I, I, I actually, these four guys are non-zero, but they have parameters which are depending on the others. So the number of free parameters is less um, than in the most general case. And so you'll see, so this shows, let's, you know, compare to the current state of the art. So on the left is the current state of the art, if you want, is what people have used for analyzing BOSS, in which they have uh, three free parameters. So they have uh, three level bias, B, V1, B2, and gamma two, uh, this uh, quadratic uh, tidal tensor, they assume that is local Lagrangian, so they assume that it's related to V1. So that was not a free parameter. And then they have one noise parameter, which is common to the power spectrum and to the bi spectrum. Okay, so that's the total number of parameters. So if you go at 2K of 0.2, uh, for the same galaxies I showed that uh, before, you see that you see some tension between the power spectrum and the bi spectrum, okay? And uh, particularly this noise parameter wants to be different things for different statistics, and you see all kinds of issues uh, with this uh, simple model. Whereas if you go to the more general tree model with uh, seven parameters in total, uh, you can see the chi-square uh, decreases by roughly a factor of two, although still this is not really getting quite the uh, correct answer for the linear bias. Once you include loops, everything works uh, much better and the constraints look a lot more reasonable. So this is, uh, you know, an, clearly an improvement. Um, if you look triangle by triangle in the three-point function or by spectrum, um, this is the, um, the previous uh, model that people have used. Um, this is the by spectrum, the, dotted, uh, the dots mean the, uh, for each triangle, so as a function of k, there are a whole bunch of triangles. Each dot is a measured triangle with error bar. The error bars are so small, you cannot see them. Um, and the line is the model. And here's the deviation of the model. Okay, so you can see that there are roughly, depending on triangle shape, deviations of order eight to 10%. Once you include the loops, you see now this, the model works a lot better and it's roughly uh, within a couple of percent. Um, also, once you include loops um, in the bi spectrum, uh, you see a nice trend uh, 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 when you compare it to the power spectrum alone, okay? And the, say, constraints on linear bias are very uh, narrow, narrow uh, and tight. Uh, the constraint on the quadratic bias agrees with this dashed line, which is what we expect from the uh, fits that people have done to numerical simulations using the peak background split. Uh, you see this is lower than the local Lagrangian value, which is the dashed line, which is what you expect as well. So you see all kinds of things that you know should be there. Um, the key question is how much do we gain by including these loop corrections and adding the bi spectrum on top of the power spectrum? So let's consider for simplicity, say, k max of 0.2, which is what people usually or have done in the past. So you can see the constraint on the linear bias uh, decreases roughly by a factor of three once you add bispectrum information, okay? 
Um, now, this is for a fixed uh, cosmology. I'll mention later what happens if you start varying cosmology, in particular sigma 8, which is the interesting thing. Now, in the, in, the, in the past, people have argued that you don't need these loops. There are a few papers that say you just forget about the loops and add what is known as higher derivative bias, which are terms that, goes as, that go as k squared. Those terms can, can be generated by the fact that the bias doesn't depend on the uh, density at a particular point in space. Uh, at the same point you are calculating the galaxies, but on some uh, scale r away from it, because you are collecting matter from some radius r. And those terms are also generated from the fact that um, matter um, fluctuations do not evolve as a perfect uh, fluid, but you generate a stress tensor as well. So those, so those things generate all kinds of new operators, which uh, are actually easier to calculate than, than loops because they are just uh, they are not uh, loop corrections. So people have argued instead of including loops, you can include that. But those terms are a whole bunch of new number of parameters, and the question is, do we need them? And is, is it actually true that including this and forgetting loops is it's enough? And just to summarize here, you can see that that's not uh, correct. So if I just do three level without loops and are the derivatives, the fits are significantly worse than if I just have loop corrections. And the adding derivatives has 15 parameters, but it's worse than the loops, which have 10 parameters. So we actually don't see that that's a better model. OK, so finally, this is what I mentioned at the beginning, that, or uh, a few minutes ago, that you can look at the time evolution of these parameters. Um, and you can just see, compared to the initial value, what is the final value. And in some cases, you can, for this, for example, these operators, which are, uh, appear in a single diagram at fourth order, you can assume that these guys are zero at the beginning, then it will be given by the, uh, by in terms of the other parameters. So in that sense, these are not free parameters anymore if you can assume them to be zero. So the question, can, can we do the same at cubic order to reduce the number of parameters even further? So that's what we do here. We reduce uh, three more parameters, okay? And we see that the, uh, you know, the penalty in chi square is really marginal. So at the end, we have uh, seven parameters instead of 10, which is the same parameters that you have at three level. And we have a model which works a lot better than, than just three level. Um, and so here you can see how that reduced set works you know, very well, even though the number of parameters has been reduced by an additional three. Um, and now if you use that model with, with the seven parameters, now you see that adding by spectrum information improves by a factor of four instead of a factor of three. So finally, the last point I want to make is, okay, that's interesting in terms of fixed cosmology. One of the most interesting applications of this is what happens now if I don't know the amplitude of the power spectrum. In other words, if I don't know sigma eight. Um, so now I have an extra parameter. Instead of seven, I have eight. So here's what happens now. Instead of having sigma eight as a parameter, I have AS, which is basically sigma eight squared. So that's the amplitude of the linear spectrum. And as is well known, uh, if I have only power spectrum information, uh, the, the Basically, what you measure is B1 square AS in the galaxy power spectrum. So there is a very strong degeneracy, which is given by that line. And the power spectrum has a very, uh, you know, it's a very tough uh, time in actually resolving that degeneracy. So if you look at AS, it has a very wide um, uh, marginalized uh, likelihood. Once I add the bispectrum information, you can see that it breaks that degeneracy and it is, you know, once I add by spectrum information, that constraint goes, again, down by a factor of four. Now, if I, instead of doing loops, I use the model that, that people have used uh, recently in analyzing the Bosch survey, you see now that, that the problem, okay, because now the constraint on AS is biased. So it's actually, we don't get the right answer, which is one in this case. 
you get you are biased by basically four sigma um, in getting the right uh, sigma eight. So um, including the loops actually makes you consistent with the uh, with the correct answer for sigma eight or for AS, as opposed to um, using this very simplified model. Okay, so to conclude, as we go into the nonlinear regime, even very weakly nonlinear at k of 0.1, we see that the loops uh, due to bias become important, and that's important in bringing consistency in the treatment that people do for p of k, in which they already include the loops, and the bias spectrum in which so far they haven't. Uh, it's much more robust in extracting cosmological information. Uh, you can reduce the proliferation of bias parameters that uh, appears when you go to high order in perturbation theory by using time evolution um, to uh, write the uh, final amplitudes or these bias parameters in terms of the initial ones. And we saw in terms of the models in the literature with the model being used uh, to analyze survey, just three level bias is better. Adding derivatives is better, but it has a significant number of parameters. But we found a model uh, with loop corrections, which has the same numbers of parameters as three that performs much better than all the others. And one has to be careful with uh, including um, dependence on the amplitude of the power spectrum because simple models can actually lead to significant bias in recovering sigma. I'll stop there. Thanks. Questions, Asim? So I guess you don't want Kmax to be too small. You won't have constraints, and if it's too large, you'll go into one halo. So how do you, how do you know that your Kmax is such that your model is accurately describing it without having to worry about fully nonlinear? Yeah, here for for time constraints, I, I concentrated on point two, but. In practice, what you can do is to vary k max and see how far you know your results don't you know don't change and just the error bar shrink. Um, uh, and of course, you can test it with simulations. So, so far we haven't, but because we haven't pushed it beyond much uh, much farther yet, because instead of you know once you have a higher k max, you have a lot more triangles. Everything is slower, but we are first trying to understand you know, buying cosmology and all these things before pushing into higher K. But roughly, I would think 0.3 would be reasonable. More than that, I doubt it, but we'll see. Depends on galaxy type also. Shut up. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about, uh, you showed improvement on bias, but what about F sigma eight? How much do you improve? Another thing is this four sigma deviation, is it only when you include bias spectrum? And if you don't include it, will you still see this four sigma deviation? at k of k max of 0.2? Um, so I didn't, I wanted to be as clean as possible, so I didn't include uh, Russian space distortions. So this is all in real space, so that's why I didn't have F sigma 8. Uh, but we've done similar things with Russian distortions and we see similar improvements in, for F sigma 8. As far as the uh, the bias when you do only power spectrum, once you have power spectrum only, the, cons the error bars on AS become quite large. So it's not four sigma, I don't remember, but it's maybe two or three sigma, the bias, yeah. Should move on now. Let's thank Roman again. <laughs>